In our last lesson, when we talked about writing systems of equations, we said that a shared ordered pair was a solution. So today we're going to practice solving them by graphing to find that shared ordered pair. Let's review some vocabulary. The rate of change is the ratio between a change in x and change in y. Slope is another word for rate of change and describes the steepness and direction of a line. Let's look at visually what that means first. All right, if you're given these two equations, x plus y equals two, x minus y equals four, they've been graphed for you. So I'm gonna actually highlight x plus y equals two, that's this line right here, and x minus y equals four, that's this line right here. So when we talked about that Venn diagram, all of these ordered pairs on this line that I just highlighted right here, those are all in this circle. Okay, imagine all those ordered pairs listed. And then x minus y equals four, that's all of, making this look like a Venn, that's all of the ordered pairs on this line. Where they overlap, represents this intersection right here in the middle. That is this point of intersection. There is only one place where these two lines intersect. The coordinates of that point of intersection are at three, negative one. What that means is this is the only point that is true for both equations. So if we substitute those coordinates into each equation, what's going to happen? Well, hopefully, it'll both be true. So let's plug and check and see what we get. Remember that for this point, x is the first number and y is the second. So our first equation, we have 3 plus negative 1 equals 2. That's a true statement. For our second equation, we have x, which is 3, minus y, which is negative 1, make that look a negative 1, equals 4. 3 minus negative 1 is 4, so that's also true. So we've checked our work and we can see that the coordinates 3, negative 1 are true for both equations. Let's do another example like that and see how much of this you can do on your own. You're given the two equations graphed to the right. Our first equation, I'm going to highlight in red, and x plus 2y equals 4. I'm going to highlight this one in blue. What are the coordinates of the point of intersection? So again, right here is where the two intersect, and I can see it is at 2, 1. Substitute the coordinates into each equation and describe the result. So our first one, we have 2 times x, which is 2, minus y, which is 1, equals 3. So 2 times 2 is 4 minus 1 equals 3, and 4 minus 1 is 3, so that's a true statement. In the second equation, we have x, which is 2, plus 2 times 1 equals 4. So that's 2 plus 2 equals 4, which is a true statement. So what can you conclude about the coordinates of the point of intersection and two linear equations? In your own words, you should have something that the coordinates of the intersection solve both equations or make it true. Let's move on to the next page. In this unit, you will study systems of linear equations in two variables. Here are two equations that form a system of linear equations here is an example of two linear equations. They have two variables, x and y, and they're going to be solved simultaneously. The solution of a linear system is the ordered pair that provides a solution to each equation in the system. In example one, you're given the graph that has two equations. Identify the solution of the system, then check your solution algebraically. You should be able to do this now, so pause and try it on your own. I've identified 2, negative 1 as the solution. When I plug that into each equation, substituting 2 for x and negative 1 for y, 
in my first equation, I find it's balanced, 4 equals 4. And in the second equation, I find it's also balanced, negative 5 equals negative 5. Try another one, same thing. Check your answer, plug it in to the equations, and solve algebraically. For this example, the solution is at 3, negative 3. So I plug those into the equations. In my first equation, I find that it's balanced, negative 3 equals negative 3. In the second one, negative 3 equals negative 3. At this point, you're probably realizing that solving by graphing has a pretty distinct limitation. And that is, it works best if the solution is whole numbers. If it's a fraction or decimal, it's not going to work very well. So it does have that limitation. Let's use the graphing method to solve a system of linear equations following these steps. First, write each equation in slope-intercept form. Second, graph each equation on the same coordinate plane. Next, identify the point of intersection and write it as an ordered pair. Last, check your answer by plugging that ordered pair back into both equations. Let's go to the next page and do some practice. To do these problems, you may want different colors of highlighters or colored pencils if that helps. Um, and you will definitely want a straight edge because you can't find a good point of intersection if you're just freehanding your lines. Look back at the steps to see what to do first. Step one, write each equation in slope-intercept form. So I'm going to take my first equation, x plus y equals negative 2, and I need to subtract x to get it on the other side. So I have y equals negative x minus 2. My second equation, 2x minus 3y equals negative 9. First, I need to move the x term to the other side. So subtract 2x. So I have negative 3y equals negative 2x minus 9. Divide by negative 3 to each term. And you get y equals, I have a negative over negative, so that's positive, 2 thirds x plus 3. Now I'm going to graph each equation on the same coordinate plane. So here's my coordinate plane, y equals negative x minus 2. So I'm going to start at negative 2 as my y-intercept, and my slope is negative 1. If it helps, you can put that negative 1 in there. So that means I'm going to go down 1 and right 1. And I would highly recommend, especially for this lesson, that you go the entire length and width of your graph because you don't know where the point of intersection is going to be. And even with a straight edge, when you graph it, you could be off by just a little bit. So do all the points. I also like to wait until the end to draw my line, so I'm going to do that last. I'm going to do my second equation now, y equals 2 thirds x plus 3. So I'm going to start at my intercept, which is positive 3, and I'm going to rise to run 3 as many times as I can. And then I'm going to, that's my positive 2, positive 3. Now I'm going to do my negative 2, negative 3, and I see where my point of intersection is. So I can graph my line. You will also find that doing as many points as possible get a straighter line, even if you're like me, and I have to freehand it because there is no using a ruler on an iPad. So I'm going to mark my point of intersection in purple here, and I see that it is at negative 3, 1. So now I can check my answer. And you can go back to the original equation or you can just do it in your slope intercept form. It does not matter. I personally prefer to go back to the original equation so that if you made an error in slope intercept form, then you're not going to catch it. So it's best to go back to your original equation. So x plus y, that's negative 3 plus 1 equals negative 2, and that is a true statement. And then I have 2 times x, which is negative 3, minus 3 times y, 
which is 1, equals negative 9. So that's negative 6 minus 3 is negative 9. So that checks. Let's go on to the next example. We're going to use the same procedures. And so our first step, step 1, write each equation in slope-intercept form. So my first one, I'll do in red here, 3x plus y equals 11. Subtract 3x on both sides. So y equals negative 3x plus 11. My second one, x minus 2y equals 6. I'm going to subtract x. And if you want to put minus 1x, that's fine. Watch your sign here. I'm left with negative 2y. That's a common mistake. Equals negative 1x plus 6. Divide by negative 2. Divide by negative 2. Divide by negative 2. So y equals positive, since I have negative and negative, positive 1 half x minus 3. Now when I go to graph these, I'm looking at my first one. My intercept is at positive 11. If you're using this graph, it doesn't go up that high. You could do it on another piece of paper and go up to positive 11, or you can just do a table of values to see what it would be if it were on the graph. Now, ordinarily on my table, I would pick negative 1, 0, 1, right? But I already know that when x is 0, y is 11. So there's no point in doing that again. So I'm going to pick a bigger number. I'm going to do... Um, 2 and 3 and just see what I end up with that. So y is negative 3 times 2 plus 11. So negative 3 times 2 is negative 6 plus 11 is 5. And then negative 3 times 3, that's negative 9 plus 11, that's 2. So you might wonder why did you pick those numbers? How did you know they would work? I was just kind of guessing like I knew about where this graph was going to go through so I just picked two numbers and they worked but you could do that through guess and check as well. So for my first equation I've got 2, 5 and 3, 2. So it's worth noting here um, if you notice my slope was negative 3 right so I went down 3 over 1 so I'm going to keep doing that now that I have two good points. I'm going to go down three over one a couple more times because again I don't know where my point of intersection is. And remember we said our intercept was at 11 so you can kind of visualize if I went up and over a couple more times that 11 would be reasonable. My second equation my intercepts at negative three and my slope is 1 over 2, so I'm going to go up 1 over 2, and I have a point of intersection. I'm just going to keep going just so I can have a better line. And once I have my point, I feel okay drawing the line. And you can see from my example why you need a straight edge, because mine are pitiful. All right, I'm going to mark my point of intersection here in purple, and it's at 4, negative 1. So if I plug that back into my original equations, I have 3 times 4 plus negative 1 equals 11, and that's a true statement. And my second equation, I have x, which is 4 minus 2 times negative 1. So 4 minus negative 2, 4 plus 2, equals 6. So it checks. Now would be a good time for you to pause and try to do the last one on your own and see how well you're doing. All right, check your work. When they rewrote both equations, they became y equals 2x plus 2 and y equals negative 1x or negative x minus 1. My pointer of intersection was at negative 1, 0, and when I plug them in, I had negative 2 times negative 1, which is 2 plus 0 equals 2, and negative 1 plus 0 is negative 1, which equals negative 1, so it checks. Let's go to the last page. I'll help you. 
In these examples, we're going to do some real-world problems that involve predictions. Systems are often used to do predictions, so this is a good application. Now, just to review, when you are doing a graph such as these, you need to have your x and y, or independent and dependent variables defined. You need to have a constant interval and constant rate on both your x and y axis. Otherwise, your predictions are not going to be in the right spot. So let's first set up the problem. You're comparing the membership at two different health clubs. Club one has 400 members and the rate is 25 people per month. Remember rate is another word for slope. And then club two, there are currently 200 members and it's increasing at a rate of 50 people per month. Predict the membership at both health clubs when it will be the same. So I'm gonna highlight some information first. Our independent variable is usually a rate of time. So if we look in here, we can see that in both we are changing per month. So I'm going to label months on the x-axis. And just to make it a little bit easier to read, I'm going to skip. So I'm at zero. And I'm going to skip a box one, skip a box two, three, four. It's okay to skip boxes as long as you do it consistently. And then my second variable, what depends on the months? What is the other important information on here? Predict when the membership at both clubs will be the same. So our second variable... I'm going to put on the y-axis is the number of members. Now, I don't really know how high we need to go to get to our answer, but I can see that I'm starting at 400 members with one and 200 members with the other. So I'm going to have to count pretty high. So I think I'm going to count by 50. So each box is going to be 50. So there's 50 and then I'm just going to write 100. I'm not going to write the 50s in because it'll just make it too muddled. It's going to be muddled enough as it is. 300, 350, 400. And again, you might be wondering, well, how did you know what to count by? Because that's usually the thing that's hardest for students is to just get started. And I don't know. Um, that's why I do math in pencil, so I can erase when I make mistakes. Um, and you might just have to do it on a separate sheet of paper if the first one doesn't work out, and that's okay. So now we're going to graph to do our prediction. All right, I'm going to do club number one in red and club number two in blue. So club number one, there are currently 400 members. So at time zero, currently we're at 400 so that becomes my y-intercept. And membership is increasing at a rate of 25 people per month. So after one month, I'm going to be 25 more people. So that's going to be halfway in between. So that means after two months, I'll be at 450. And then at three months, 75. And four months... 500. I'm trying to be precise here. So at this point, I can see that I'm rising one and run one, two, three, four. So I'm just going to do that from now on. Rise one, run four. Rise one, run four. Out there at eight months. All right. In blue club two, there are currently 200 members. So that's where I'm starting. And membership is increasing at a rate of 50 people per month. So at one month, I'm at 250. At two months, 300. So now I can see I rise one, run two. And I'm getting closer to a point of intersection. It looks like it's right there. I was just barely not on my graph. So what I'm predicting here, it looks like if I extended this graph by just one more, my point of intersection is at 8 
and if I go over this way, 600. Now I could check my work by plugging both of those in. So for the first month, I've got 25 times X, which is 8, plus 400. Does that equal 600? Well, 25 times 8, that's 200 plus 400, that is 600. And then the second one is 50 times 8 plus 200. So that's 400 plus 200, which does equal 600. So the question is, when will the membership be the same? It will be the same at eight months. And what will the membership be? 600 members. Let's try another one. You are studying the enrollment at two school districts. District A has 5,750 students, and it's decreasing by 500 per year. District B has 3,500 students, and it's decreasing by 250 per year. Predict how many years it will take for there to be an equal number of students in the two districts. So our main information here, you can see we're going to have two variables, and that's the how many years and how many students. So I'm going to label my x-axis with years. How about I do that in black? And my y-axis is the number of students. All right, so for years, I'm just going to count by one. So I've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And again, I don't know if that's going to work out right, but I'm going to try it, see if it works. Now for students, I'm counting and I see that I've got 5,750, 3,500. So I'm gonna have to count by something pretty big to fit it all on here. Um, let me erase this students and move it over a little bit so I have some room for some numbers here. I know I have to go up pretty high, so I'm gonna make each box um, 500. So the first one's going to be 500, so the second one is 1,000, and then skip one, 2,000, skip one, 3,000, skip one, 4,000, skip one, 5,000, skip one, 6,000. So that's as high as I need to go because the biggest number is 5,750 and it's decreasing. So now I'm going to graph the first equation. We know we have to start at 5,750 students, so that's going to be halfway in between 5,500 and uh, 6,000. It's decreasing by 500 per year. So after one year, that's not very well in the middle. I'm trying to go in the middle, which is down 500. And so I'm going to go down one over one as many times as I can. This should be easier for you on paper than it is for me on the screen. Okay, so that's about as far as I can go. And again, I'm not going to draw the line until I'm done. The second one, I'm starting at 3,500 students, so it's going to be exactly on that dot, and it's decreasing by 250 per year. So that's going to be a little bit harder because I'm going to go down one half and over one, down one half and over one. So that means down one over two. I'm going to just keep going. Try to get as many as possible. Okay, now here's where your straight edge is going to be really important because I don't have an exact corner. 
I'm just gonna try to draw this as straight as I can. And it looks to me like it's gonna be a round here. So I'm gonna guess that that's at about nine and it's a little bit over. It's gonna be a thousand something. I'm gonna guess about 1250 and then if I plug that in I can see if it works so in district a um, the number of students was negative 500 so that's what was decreasing negative 500 plus a starting value of 5750 and our second equation was decreasing 250 and it started at 3,500. So if I plug in 1250 equals negative 500 times nine, it's gonna be negative 4,500 plus 5,750. Plug that into my calculator and that checks out. And then the second equation, I've got 1250 equals negative 250 times 9 plus 350. I'm sorry, 3,500. And that also checks out. So this is one of those where the prediction worked out, but it could be really hard to see on this graph. So if you made the graph a little bit bigger so that your intervals were a little bit smaller, uh, then it might be a little bit easier to make a prediction or you could solve it another way, which we will do in the future. All right, last one. Emma and Evie are saving for a new car. Emma has $2,000 and she plans to save an additional $50 per month. Evie has $1,600 and she plans to save an additional $100 per month. In how many months will Emma and Evie have the same amount of money saved? First thing I want you to do, pause this identify your independent and dependent variables and label your graph. All right, check your work. Months should be on the x-axis and I counted by ones. And dollars, that's supposed to be a dollar sign there, it's not very good. Dollars is on the y-axis and I counted by 250. So I just labeled every fourth box, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. All right, next I want you to identify your two equations and graph them. Okay, I've graphed my two equations. Emma started at 2000 and she went up $50 per month. So after five months, she would have another $250 and so on. And then Evie started at 1600 and she went up $100 per month. So I didn't draw the lines yet because I wanted us to look. We can see here at the fifth month that, uh, who was in red? Emma has more but by the 10th month that Evie has a little bit more. So we know our answer is going to be somewhere in between these two. Now again, if you have a straight edge, this is going to be a lot better, but I'm going to try to draw this as straight as I can and see, let me redo that because I really shouldn't extend past zero here and I can do better. Okay, that's pretty good. And then let's do EV in blue. Let's try one more time. Okay, that's not too bad. So now I'm going to find my point of intersection. And it looks to me like that's a pretty good point. So that's at about 8... And if I go over, I'm less than 2,500. So I'm going to guess 2,400. So I'm going to plug these in again and see what I get. So for Emma, Emma's total is always going to be $50 per month, X, plus she started with 2,000. So I'm going to plug these numbers in, 2,400 equals 50 
times 8 plus 200. And just as a note, that I'm sorry, plus 2,000. Um, the reason I came up with 2,400 is because I was thinking 50 times 8 plus 2,000. So I wasn't just blindly guessing. I was doing that um, in my head. And then the next one, Evie started with 1600 but she saved $100 per month plus 1600 So, again, I was kind of doing this in my head. Oops. Let's plug that in. 2400 does equal 100 times 8. That's 800 plus 1600 so that checks. And that's how we can use systems by graphing to make predictions.